Welcome everyone, this is Robin Duncan. I am here with my husband, Terry Macy. Hi everyone, it's great to be with you again. This is our A Course of Miracles Global Study Group, and tonight we are on Chapter 21, the second class, and we are also covering section number two called Responsibility for Sight. Let's start with an opening prayer. Take in a nice, deep, relaxing breath. Dear God, we come to you today and we place ourselves in your holy hands. There are so many things going on, so many temptations to judge, to be worried, maybe even afraid. Today we simply take refuge in you. We lean in more. We are reminded that the protection, the healing, our safety does not depend on us. It depends on you. And so today, we place ourselves in your care along with all of our loved ones. And I have a son, one of our six that we have together, and he's out over the ocean and headed to the Philippines. He's a pilot, and it's a long trip for the type of aircraft that he flies. And so as a mom, I'm always eager to know when he gets there and how things are going. So I hold him in my heart tonight, and I ask all of you to join me too, that we just see him having a perfect flight and the refueling that has to happen in the air on the way to the Philippines, that all of that is done so smoothly, easily, perfectly. And we just thank you, God, for the most peaceful outcome for all of us here in everything that we are thinking about today. Amen. Well, our topic today is called Responsibility for Sight. This is one of my favorite sections in the book. And the first time that I read it, it was so eye-opening. The language is direct and it's powerful. It's very simple language and it tells us exactly what to do if we would like to have vision, happiness, release from pain, complete escape from sin, in other words, illusion. Wouldn't you like to know what we need to do exactly to have freedom from all of those things, along with vision and happiness? Well, the guidance in this section, it might appear to be a little punitive, but it is not, and I will explain why when we get there. You might remember those old sayings like, you made your bed and now you have to lay in it. And it always sounded like if you made a mistake, you must pay the price. And that's not the case here. So we will talk more about that. Our ego does not like this section one bit. And you will understand why after we read a little further. So Terry, without further ado, what do you have for us today to launch us with some laughter? All right, well my laughter today is called Brain Transplant. So all the relatives gathered in the waiting room at their local hospital or a family member lay gravely ill. Finally, the doctor came in looking tired and somber. I'm afraid I'm the bearer of bad news, he said as he surveyed the worried faces. The only hope left for your loved one at this time is a brain transplant. It's an experimental procedure, quite risky, and you'll have to pay for the brain yourselves. The family members sat silent as they absorbed the news. Eventually someone asked, well, how much does a brain cost? The doctor quickly responded, a female brain goes for $20,000. A male brain costs $50,000. 
The moment turned awkward. The men in the room tried not to smile, avoiding eye contact with the women, but some actually smirked. They couldn't help it. A girl, unable to control her curiosity, blurted out the question everyone wanted to ask. Why does the male brain cost so much more? The doctor smiled at her childish innocence and then said to the entire group, It's a standard pricing procedure. We mark the female brains down because they're used. <laughs> <laughs> well, there okay, you go. guys, we got to step up our all. game here. <laughs> <laughs> they're actually used. Yep. <laughs> Time to use those brains. <laughs> I'm a guy, so I can get away with telling this joke. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. That was a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started with Chapter 21, Section 2, The Responsibility for Sight, Paragraph Number 1. We have repeated how little is asked of you to learn this course. It is the same small willingness you need to have your whole relationship transformed to joy. The little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit for which he gives you everything. The very little on which salvation rests. The tiny change of mind by which the crucifixion is changed to resurrection. As he launches off into this powerful section, one of the things that clearly stands out to me is he's saying that the gifts we offer to the Holy Spirit, in exchange, he's going to give us everything. So just think about that. And he says our gift is rather small, where his gift is everything. And it's going to change our crucifixion to resurrection. Now, you may not feel as though you're being crucified, but you might feel that life is not quite fair or you're not getting your fair share or your fair shot at something or things are against you, odds are against you. These are all along those same lines of just feeling like you're not very loved or valued in this world. And he's going to change all that, what's coming up here. Sentence three. And being true... It is so simple that it cannot fail to be completely understood. Rejected, yes, but not ambiguous. And if you choose against it now, it will not be because it is obscure, but rather that this little cost seemed in your judgment to be too much to pay for peace. He teaches us that the truth is true, and there is no other way to look at it, that the truth is true. And the truth doesn't depend on whether we agree or disagree. We can reject it, like it says in sentence four, but it, we cannot change it. And it is not obscure. So we can live our lives and we can reject the truth. But if we are willing, we can welcome the truth. That sounds so simple, doesn't it? But it's not that simple. Because let's say that you have a family member and they just did something very cruel. You found it to be very cruel, very unusual, and you're very upset by the whole thing. Well, it's much easier to be angry at them than to consider that they are playing a role with you based on your belief system, which means that the responsibility for everything that's happening actually comes back to us. It has nothing to do with blame. Blame is something that the ego uses to target its judgment. It simply is. You know, if you bang a drum and you hear a drumming sound, the drum is not to blame for the drumming sound. It is simply responsible for the drumming sound. So I'd like you to hear what he's about to say without judgment for yourself or even for those people that are playing those roles with you. But this is where we want to really get things turned around because our life can change so dramatically when we realize that people are not causing our pain, our upset, our discomfort. 
they're actually reflecting it to us. What we believe to be true, they are acting it out for us. And we really wouldn't know what those deep, hidden, rooted beliefs are unless those people did play those roles because we can actually see it out there on the stage of life. Let's go to paragraph two. This is the only thing that you need do for vision, happiness, release from pain, and the complete escape from sin, all to be given you. Say only this, but mean it with no reservations, for here the power of salvation lies. I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. So those are the words those beautiful words that he says will bring us so much that we are responsible for what we see. Now let's say that you have some kind of terrible illness. Nobody wants to hear that I'm responsible for this illness or I'm responsible for this pain. Again, it's not about blame. When we are sick, and I've been sick before, Terry's been sick before, but we can only be sick while we believe that we are a body that can be sick. Well, that's something that most people do believe. Out of 6.8 billion people, there's probably well over 99% of that population that believes that they are a body that can be sick. But we are learning through A Course in Miracles that we are not a body, that the body is the effect of our misperception that we can be separated from God. We are, as God created us, we are eternal spirit. We cannot be sick because God did not create sickness. But if we accept that we are a body, which means we are rejecting the truth of us simply because we don't really know that we did that or how to correct it, God gave us the Holy Spirit the bridge of consciousness that knows the absolute realm of truth as God created it. And the Holy Spirit also knows when you have an electric bill to pay or something to take care of or you need to clip a fingernail that's too long. The Holy Spirit knows every detail of our illusions. And that's why we have a perfect guide to lead us back to what is true. So when you hear those words, I am responsible for what I see. Try not to use those words against yourself. So if you are sick or you're struggling with something very big or scary, you might think, okay, if I'm the one that created this, then I must be flawed or I must not be spiritual enough or maybe I'm not meditating enough or talking to God enough. And just quiet your mind It's not about you not doing something right. It means we have a misperception. And in this misperception, we've been given a guide to show our way back to what is real and true. So whatever going on, our very first step in reclaiming our power, our God-given power, is to remember the power of God is within us. We are the dreamer of our dream. We are looking at the story in place of what is real and true. And what is real and true is still there. It's almost like we've covered our eyes and we don't see the light. We might think that light went out. It might seem to be gone entirely. But it's because we have a block in front of our vision. Now we might have a belief that darkness is real and there is no light. That doesn't make it true. It makes it convincing. And so the ego is very convincing. And the whole theme of the ego is that you are a body that can be sick, that is less than perfect, less than whole. And if we listen to the ego, which is the part of our mind that is holding this whole misperception, 
that we could be separated from God, separated from each other. The ego is the part of our mind that we assign the function to hold that false idea in place. When you give it your attention and you make it mean something, it doesn't mean that you're going to create something real. It means you're going to lose sight of what is real. Again, it's like covering your eyes and thinking the light went out. So when our eyes are covered, we're losing the benefit of the light. doesn't mean it's gone. It means it's right there for us. But we are here to allow, if we will, the Holy Spirit, this bridge of consciousness to show us where we have a misperception and then to allow the Holy Spirit to undo that misperception for us. Now, that sounds so simple, doesn't it? But while we are asleep and dreaming, which we are, and we're focused on things going on in the dream, I mean, who isn't? We all are. But we're trying to look at it and realize that God did not create these conditions where people would fight or be at war or get sick or be sad or be broke or broken. So there's our hint right there that we're looking at illusion because God did not create these things. And that's what I use as my rule of thumb. I look at what I see. It's all illusion, but especially those illusions that really get my attention. I look at them and I remind myself, God did not create this, and therefore it's not based in the truth. In fact, it's not based in reality. Again, because we see something, we feel it, we can hear it, sometimes we can taste it. We use our senses to determine what is real, but yet we sleep at night and in our dreams at night. We can see and feel and taste and touch and hear, and it's not real, is it? It's convincing, but it's not real. Only what God created is real and true and eternal and invulnerable. This is the good news because that reality that was created for us is still there. It's never left. And so that will become something we are aware of when our vision is no longer blocked. Well, how do we get there? One of the first steps is to say to yourself, and you can repeat those words after me, I must have decided wrongly because I am not at peace. I made the decision myself. But I can also decide otherwise. This is all from page 90, which I love. I want to decide otherwise. Because I want to be at peace. The Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of my wrong decision if I will let him. Now, where I was saying before that those words in the second paragraph of section two, they might seem punitive. I am responsible for what I see and everything happens exactly the way that I chose it to be that kind of thing, and it's not punitive because he's just helping us to understand we're not looking at the truth, and if we will realize that it's not the truth and ask for the truth instead of what we see, then the Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of wrong decisions if we will let him. So there is no punishment. There is no pain. There is only freedom and celebration that comes from this. Sentence number six. Deceive yourself no longer if you are helpless in the face of what is done to you. Acknowledge but that you have been mistaken and all effects of your mistakes will disappear. So he's telling us there, similar to page 90, that if we will acknowledge that we are not helpless, that we are looking at things that are being projected from our thoughts and beliefs. And if we will acknowledge that 
and also remind ourselves that we are mistaken in what we are perceiving then all effects of our mistakes will disappear. And that may sound grandiose, but it's true. I know Terry and I both have seen this happen. The more we realize that we're not looking at the truth and we call on our teacher of peace, the Holy Spirit, to help us, to heal our mind, to redirect our thoughts, that we will see all effects be undone. And there's so many aspects of life where this happens. All of our relationships have healed. Our life as a family, everything is peaceful most of the time. It wasn't always this way. Even our credit scores have been healed. Amazing how the Holy Spirit is all-inclusive. He doesn't heal one illusion and leave another illusion for you to trip on. They all heal together, and you're going to see this if we do the little that he asks. But it does take some self-reflection to say, you mean I'm the one that's responsible for what I see? What if I see an accident? I don't want an accident to happen. Well, the way that I look at it is if you drive up, see an accident happen in front of you, let's say for this example, you're not in the accident, you're just witnessing it, it would tell you, if you look deeply, that you probably have some belief that people are vulnerable or that accidents do happen or they can be a real problem or things can happen in life very suddenly and throw things off track. While we entertain these kinds of thoughts in our minds, It's very likely that we see an accident to prove that we are right about all of those thoughts and beliefs. I want you to see that this is just natural consequence from your misperception. It's not God judging you and saying, oh, this person over there, they have these beliefs that bad things can happen, so I'm just going to show them this bad thing. It's not personal. It's literally cause and effect. If you hold a thought in your mind, even if it's not based on the truth, it's based on a misperception, you're the holy child of God, and you do create like God does. Now, when we're coming from a misperception, we're not really creating anything at all because it's based on a faulty belief. But you do have the capacity to create with God based on what is real and true. He says that when you're creating based on a misperception, that's called projection. You're not really creating anything at all. It's almost imagined like it is when you sleep at night. So just be aware that we are taking responsibility for what we see, recognizing that we are projecting whatever we see or feel or hear or touch. And it's really exciting after that because now you have a guide to show you how everything can be corrected in the right direction. Think how quickly a dream can change when the dreamer no longer has any investment in the dream being dark at all. Paragraph number three. It is impossible the Son of God be merely driven by events outside of him It is impossible that happenings that come to him were not his choice. We can use as an example the world we see. We're looking at the potential for war or people at war. And so you might think, well, that's happening way over there. That's not happening for me, so I don't have to worry about that. Well, I like to look at it as a place in my mind where I can practice and I can pray and I can be willing to see things differently. I look out into the world I see, and I see this war and attack and destruction or separated interests. Well, I know right away that I must have thoughts that support what I'm seeing with my eyes. So it tells me right away that I can pray about these things. Very simple. We can just go to our prayer time, and we can say, Dear God, this war over there, maybe 
the potential for things to get worse. And I bring this to you because if there's any place in my mind where I am accepting that war is normal or expected or even possible, if there's any place in my mind where I'm seeing people with separated interests, separated identities, that I'm seeing people as vulnerable or attacked or villains or victims, please heal that place in my mind. I have no interest and going forward with these misperceptions. These are misperceptions because God did not create the conditions. If we go back to what God created, what is real and true, that is where our safety lies. So one quick way to get there is you can go to your guide, the Holy Spirit, and you can say, Holy Spirit, will you decide for me about this war business and this attack and the persecution and the destruction and the people that are scared and leaving their towns. Very startling when you watch it on the news or you hear about it or watch a video. Think about it. One of the best ways you can help every one of them is in your prayer time. And it's to choose the light of truth for them. Instead of just being sad, which is easy to do because it's a very sad situation, that doesn't necessarily help them. It reinforces the idea that this is our life and there's nothing we can do. But there's everything we can do because we are the dreamer of our dreams. So take that situation, give it to God, and add in something very important. Add in the thoughts that you are holding that are likely contributing to what you see with your eyes. It doesn't mean you want more. In my mind, it means that somewhere in your mind and mine, we must have a belief that war is possible, that people can be hurt, that other people are oppressors or they are selfish or looking out for their needs at the cost of other people. And we don't have to know every single thought that we don't have right in our mind because the Holy Spirit will take care of that. But we have to recognize enough, I call it informed consent, so that when we ask the Holy Spirit to heal our mind, we know what we're asking. If you only think of one thought and you're unwilling to look at all these other thoughts that you might be entertaining, well, then the Holy Spirit can't fully heal those thoughts from your mind because you don't fully recognize where it's coming from. So let's go ahead and take that responsibility that we are the dreamer of our dream. Right now we're looking out and seeing these things that we do not like. And if they upset your peace in any way, well, now we have a perfect opportunity to take it straight to prayer and to ask God to heal any place in our mind where we decided or accepted that these things are even possible. And this is what gives the Holy Spirit the floor time, I call it, the floor time with us, with our mind, to heal those misperceptions. And then when those misperceptions are healed within us, our eyes will report the healing. He tells us that our eyes do not see, they report what we believe. And right now they are reporting what we believe to be true in the place of truth, but we'd really like our eyes to report what is true and not what is not true. Let's go to sentence three. His power of decision is the determiner of every situation in which he seems to find himself by chance or accident. No accident nor chance is possible within the universe as God created it, outside of which is nothing. The last chapter in A Course in Miracles is called Choose Again. And it really is that simple. Let's say that you've grown up your whole life believing that you're not safe. And everywhere you go, you might be looking over your shoulder or worried or locking your door. or And those things are fine. Except that if we hold that belief system, we are creating what we defend against. If the dreamer has a great fear that they're not safe, they're very likely to have a dream that reflects 
that they're not safe. Doesn't that make sense? So let's say you're walking along in the middle of the day and you feel pretty safe. You've taken all the precautions, right, that you normally do. And you're walking along in the day and let's say all of a sudden a whole group of people come running out of a bank. Maybe they just robbed it and they're firing guns and it's so scary. And you have a decision to make right there. There's a choice to be made. And the choice is this. Am I going to revalidate that I'm not safe? Because if I do, well, now it's very likely in the dream that I could be impacted by what I see and not very happy with the results. But in a flash, I could say, Holy Spirit, will you decide for me about this and choose safety for me because I might have forgotten how. (laughs) But you decide for me. That's enough. That's enough. We don't have to pray for hours on end. We don't have to purify our minds. He says, don't purify yourself before you come to me. But we can always go straight to our teacher of peace and ask for help. And not in help in keeping us safe, because basically we're asking our illusion to be validated. Of course, you can ask for that, and he will help. But you see, when you ask to be safe, you are safe. And so the only one in denial of that is us as the dreamer. So instead of saying, God, please keep me safe, which is just fine, by the way, but if we'd like to have things stop in terms of this whole life not being safe for us, we can say, Holy Spirit, will you decide for me about this? If there's any place in my mind where I've decided about not being safe or not being protected, will you heal that place? I choose safety the safety God has given me, the safety that is mine. We know when you're scared, you may not be able to think of all that, but you can remind yourself to say, Holy Spirit, decide for me, or God, decide for me. I choose peace. And if you can't remember that, you can say, I choose peace. You see, when you choose peace, it's an inclusive package. You don't find loss or danger in peace. It's not peaceful. So when you say my goal is peace or I choose peace, we want to include everyone we see because they're all figures in our dream. But know that you can ask for help anytime, all the time, and try not to be the healer yourself because when you do, you're going to interrupt the healing process and that will cause a delay. So our part is the asking. The Holy Spirit's function is the healing. So we'll keep our responsibilities straight. Sentence five. Suffer, and you decided sin was your goal. I wanted to stop there because when we are suffering, it doesn't mean that we're just laying on the couch in pain. It can mean that. Suffering can mean that you don't have enough money or you don't feel very loved or appreciated you can feel sick and that you don't feel like God loves you because you feel like you're just being allowed to suffer. It says suffer and you decided sin was your goal. Now, again, that can sound punitive, but it's not. In A Course in Miracles, sin means error. It doesn't mean you did something bad. It means you missed the mark. It's an error. It's a misperception. So you could read it as when you are suffering, you must have decided that your misperception was the truth. You see, it's the same thing. I just wanted to clear that up. He's not punishing you. He's not saying, now you must suffer because you have sinned. No, that's what we used to believe, and we carry a lot of guilt about that kind of language, but it doesn't mean the same thing in A Course in Miracles. So just realize that if you are suffering in any way, It means that you have decided that your misperception, that you are a body that can be sick, that can be broke, that can be without love, you've decided that those things are true and real, doesn't make them true and real, but what it does do is it will keep you from remembering what is real and true while you hold on to them. One of the things that A Course in Miracles repeats again and again is that truth and illusions are irreconcilable. The minute you hold on to one, 
you're going to forfeit your awareness of the other. It's like being awake and asleep at the same time. So when you see something that is troubling you, you know you're looking at the projection of one of your or my misperceptions. And then we can redirect. I call it the 51% club. We want to get 51% of our mind at least, this is me, not a course of miracles, but get 51% of your mind over to the majority that is much more interested in the truth instead of illusion. At first, you won't be able to do 100%. It's not likely. You might do it in flashes and really have a great benefit as a result, but we walk in illusions 24-7. So the likelihood that you'll be able to hold it all the time it's unlikely, but that's okay because our guide does hold it 24-7. Think how safe you are if you fully rely on your guide that has never forgotten God's love for you and all that is planned for you and everything good for you and the happy outcome in every situation. You have a guide with you all the time that is within you right now just waiting to be asked but we forget to ask. And it's not because we're particularly stubborn. We're just a little troubled or a lot troubled by what our eyes are looking at. And it can be really scary. And while we're scared, we forget to ask. So don't forget to ask. Even if you write it on your hand, Holy Spirit, decide for me. And just do that for a day. Just look at the palm of your hand. And you'll get the idea. And pretty soon... If anything troubles you with your eyes, you can call on your guide and you can set that goal of peace and you can have some help so things will get better. Sentence six. Be happy and you gave the power of decision to him who must decide for God for you. Now that sentence, it's about being happy. So What do we do? What if we're not feeling happy? He says, be happy. And you gave the power of decision to him who must decide for God for you. You could think of it this way. Let's say you're sitting in neutral in the driveway. Your car is in neutral, not going anywhere. Well, he's saying if you put it in, let's say, happy gear, right, automatically the Holy Spirit is going to decide for God for you because You've already put it in the happy gear. Let's say first gear is happy gear. So we put it in happy gear. Automatically, the Holy Spirit goes, oh, I know where you're going. You put it in gear. You're already heading towards happiness. So now I can tag along and I can finish this for you because I see where you're going here. Well, now on certain days, you may not feel very happy. In fact, you might be absolutely unhappy, scared, worried, shaking, and that's okay. Let's say you wake up full of dread and you don't know what to do. You're sitting in neutral. You haven't gone anywhere in your car, right? And you haven't put anything in gear. It's okay. But what is critical right in your bed when you're feeling dread is you don't want to put your gear into dread because the Holy Spirit doesn't do dread. And so the Holy Spirit will have to stand down until you change your mind. But let's say you're laying there and you're just feeling pretty awful about the day. You can pause right there. You can go to God with complete honesty. And you say, dear God, as I lay here, I am really not feeling very good about today. There's a lot of things that are really troubling me. But I choose a happy day. I have not a clue how to get there. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get there. So I call on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, will you please decide on happiness for me? I want happiness not dread. So you decide for me, I will let you, and I will receive this blessing. You see, we didn't put our car into the first happy gear, but we also didn't put it into the first dread gear either. So when you're in neutral and you are deciding how you're going to go about your day, this is what you can do. You can either put it in that happy gear and get rolling. That's fine. Holy Spirit will know right away what to do. But if you can't get to that gear, then you ask Holy Spirit to get to that gear for you, and it will be accomplished. Sentence 7. This is the little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit, 
and even this he gives to you to give yourself. For by this gift is given you the power to release your Savior, that he may give salvation unto you. So let's look at this. What is our little gift here? Now, taking responsibility for your dream does many things. But what you see with your eyes, let's say you're really mad at that person right over there across the room. But you're reminding yourself, oh, yeah, chapter 21, section 2, I am responsible for what I see. Sometimes you'll just shake your head like, oh, so much easier to be mad, isn't it? So we go, okay, I am responsible for what I see. Well, what does that mean? It means that I really shouldn't judge this person for acting the way that they are because they are a figure in my dream. I'm the dreamer. I wrote the script for them to act out. And if they're not treating me with love or kindness or respect, it's because I don't expect them to. Somewhere in my mind, I either have a decision against me or against them or both. So maybe I have a belief that I don't deserve love. Maybe I made a lot of mistakes in my life and I am holding myself hostage and I am choosing to feel guilty. When we do this, we are going to bring in persecutors like crazy, usually people that are very close to you, and that can bring you right to your knees, right? So when we have these thoughts that we don't like what this person said or did, then we remind ourselves, I am responsible for what I see. Everything everybody is saying and doing is coming from my mind. And I don't want this. I don't want it to continue. Now, we can't solve it out there any more than you can solve a dream at night outside of yourself in your bedroom. It doesn't get solved there. It must be solved in your mind between your ears, let's say. I like this to say things so you'll remember, but it must be solved between your ears, but not by you or me. We are the dreamer of our dream. And if we have these thoughts, if we're the ones that have gotten lost, we are probably not the ones to find ourselves. We need help. And this is where we call on the Holy Spirit and we say, Holy Spirit, this person is really driving me crazy. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to change this. But I am learning that I am responsible for what I see. Now, it says in this paragraph, this little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit, you just gave the Holy Spirit a great big gift. What you've given him is that you are taking responsibility for what you see, which means that it's not really the best idea to judge the other person any more than judging the figures in your nighttime dreams for doing whatever they were doing. They didn't cause it. We did. We are the dreamer, right? So when we give him the gift of taking responsibility at the same time, simultaneously, we are releasing that other person from our judgment against them. We're taking responsibility, not blame. Nobody is to blame. It's about responsibility and awareness. Once you know where those perceptions are coming from and where that healing needs to occur, aha, now we can go to the Holy Spirit and we have a real prayer request. Holy Spirit, if I have any thoughts in my mind that are producing that people should treat me this way or that that person is incapable of love or I don't know if I'm judging them or judging me. Maybe I'm judging both. I have no interest in these judgments. We are as God created us. We are loving, perfect, whole, innocent, eternal, spiritual beings. We are not our bodies, our personalities, or our conflicts. I want the truth instead of this. As you do this, you're taking responsibility you're calling in the one that knows this answer. You're not doing the healing yourself, but you are also refusing to judge this person for their actions. You're understanding that they are playing a role with you. It's called projection, just like your nighttime dreams. And the way they act and what they say and what they do is all based on what your belief system 
cold. And if you don't like what you see, you know you have some unhealed beliefs. That's not anything to feel bad about. It is something that you have help for, and it can be corrected even instantly if we will invite it and allow it. One last point about that. He says that when you give the Holy Spirit this gift, you are given the power to release your Savior. When we release our Savior, that's the person you're mad at, whoever they are. Of course, the miracle says they are your Savior. Now, that sounds crazy, right, because you're mad at them. But this person is your Savior because they are showing you that you have some unhealed thoughts. If they're being very mean or hurtful or condescending, persecuting, you know right away because they're acting out your thought system. So they're giving you information that you can use and take straight to God. And it can be healed today if you will allow it and actually take that responsibility. But if you make this conflict about them and they're doing this to you, the dream continues and it does not get resolved yet. So they are your savior and you're offering them salvation And then what happens is they offer it right back to you. It's a beautiful thing when that happens. Paragraph four. Begrudge not then this little offering. Withhold it, and you keep the world as now you see it. Give it away, and everything you see goes with it. Never was so much given for so little. He's asking again, would you... Be willing to be responsible for what you see because then he can kick into high gear and do his part. The Holy Spirit has so many functions, but his primary function is the healing of our mind. But that can't be done. And so we ask for that healing. Otherwise, he would be controlling us or manipulating us or taking over, which he will never do. He represents perfect divine love. And the way we know that we need healing is when somebody in front of us does something that disturbs our peace. There it is. You're looking at it. You might even ask yourself, what must I believe in order to see what I'm seeing right now? Well, if you see someone that appears homeless or sad or broke or broken, then you know that you probably have some beliefs that, People are broke or broken or sad or homeless and that God has abandoned them perhaps and that people are vulnerable or frail or weak and some people have a better life. So we just want to be reflective. Like what must I believe? Because we can hand it over like apples. Let's just hand those thoughts over and we don't have to know every single thought that we have that's not quite right. But I think the Holy Spirit, at least as he works with me, it feels like he just wants to know that we understand what we're asking for and what we're allowing him to do. And the more we do that with a very genuine, whole, willing invitation, then the healing can take place very quickly. But if I'm half asking, let's say you offered somebody a ride somewhere, and they said, sure, I want that ride. And then every time they head towards the car, they turn around and go back in the house. (laughs) You can see the car wouldn't leave for a little while. So it's not that your ride isn't there, but we have to wholly want that. We have to get all the way into the car and be willing to go in a different direction. And then the Holy Spirit can do his function, which you will be very pleased about. Let's go to sentence five. In the holy instant, is this exchange effected and maintained. Here is the world you do not want brought to the one you do. And here the one you do is given you because you want it. Yet for this, the power of your wanting must first be recognized. You must accept its strength and not its weakness. You must perceive that what is strong enough to make a world can let it go and can accept correction if it is willing to see that it was wrong. This paragraph is so powerful. You might want to read it a few times. 
But as we look at it, he's saying that the power of our wanting must be recognized. So if you think about it, when you want something, you think about it a lot. You give it your time, your attention, your investment. And so let's say that you'd like to have more abundance in your life. Now, if someone was following you around with a little stopwatch, which they aren't, of course, but if they were, and they were able to take a little inventory, how much time do you think you would clock thinking about abundant things, happy things, joyful things, just allowing this flood of abundance to flow through your mind and into your life? And how much time do you think you might be thinking about lack, or not having enough money, or running out of money, or planning to move because you don't have enough money. These are things that we can control. It's called choose again. Again, if we can get 51%, at least in my mind, you know, I was an accountant for so many years, a CPA, so I like to think about numbers. And if you can get more than half of your mind in the direction of what you do want, things are going to change. But if you wake up in the morning and you'd like to have more abundance, but your first thought is what you don't have, what's not happening, what's not going well, and maybe that doesn't last all day, but literally, if you had a stopwatch and you could clock the time, would you be in that 51% club? And if you are, great. It means that the Holy Spirit at least has an open door with you. It doesn't mean that door is blown wide open yet, but the more that we allow our thought to be directed at what we want, meaning the joyful things, the happy things, that we're not fixated on limitation and unfairness and what might go wrong or could go wrong or what that person is doing wrong over there. I like to focus my thoughts on perfection because God is perfect and what he created is perfect. So when I see something that doesn't look perfect and there's plenty of things to choose, but I'll look at it and I'll say to myself, thank you, God, that this person is perfect in your name. Maybe they look sick or sad or they are having a hard time. Now, I might be the very first one to open the door for that or help them get into their car, and but I don't ever want to leave that moment without blessing them with their perfection because as I choose to know that they are perfect, perfect, eternal spirit, one with God, free of all limits. You see, not only am I actually helping them as a figure in my dream to be free of these restrictions, but I'm also helping myself because now the Holy Spirit can heal whatever thoughts I had before that are producing these limitations in front of me, and then I get the benefit of being free of those thoughts and then having the reflection of that healing in the world I see. Let's go to paragraph five. The world you see is but the idle witness that you were right. This witness is insane. So let's think about that. The world we see is an idle witness that we were right. Meaning if we see a world in chaos, conflict, war, devastation, sickness, it means that we were right about our unhealed beliefs, our beliefs that we can be sick, we can be at war, we are vulnerable, life is unfair, maybe God isn't loving us or helping us. So when we hold those thoughts, that's the kind of world we see. The world we see is the effect of our thoughts, not the cause. And he tells us in A Course in Miracles that in our mind, cause and effect are reversed. We think the world we see is causing our upset or our discomfort. No, no, no. The world you see is the effect of your belief that you are uncomfortable or in chaos or you have a split mind. So that world you see, your eyes are going to report what you believe in front of you. So when we get that squared away, this is where the Holy Spirit, remember if you get your gear in that first gear of happiness, the Holy Spirit just hops on board and takes care of his function right away. But if you can't seem to get there, you can still ask him to
to decide for you, and he will. Let's go now to sentence three. You trained it in its testimony, and as it gave it back to you, you listened and convinced yourself that what it saw was true. You did this to yourself. See only this, and you will also see how circular the reasoning on which you're seeing rests. Again, we hold these ideas in our mind, and we decide that they're real and true. Let's say you have a belief that you're not very loved in your life, that maybe the people closest to you just don't reflect that love very consistently. And you believe you're right because you've seen them not treat you with love a thousand times. And so you're convinced by what you have seen that your unhealed belief that you are not lovable is correct. So what we tend to do is use what we see to validate the unhealed belief that put it there in the first place. So it doesn't really go in that sequence. It starts with an unhealed belief that we're not loved or not lovable. Then we look out into our world, and usually it's our closest people that give us the biggest problem. Those are the biggest mirrors, right? And so the people close to us are now reflecting to us our belief that we're not loved or appreciated. And then we see them do it again, and then we use what they did to validate that we are right, that we're not lovable and we're not appreciated, and the circle goes round and round and round, but we can stop it. We can go to chapter 31, and we can just choose again, choose again, choose again. So the moment that person shows up, they do something that's not very loving right there in front of you, to you, we know we are always looking at the effect of our past thoughts. So if somebody's treating me as I'm not lovable or not respecting me, I know that at least in the past, I must have had a belief that I'm not very lovable or I shouldn't be respected. I don't maybe know where that all came from, but I could probably identify that as something that I might have been carrying around, right, if I was honest with myself. Now, In the course, in the lessons, it says that you're never upset for the reason you think and that whatever you see is the effect of your past thought. So here's a great opportunity. This person just said this mean thing to you, let's say. Now, you know that reflects your past thoughts about how you should be treated. But in the present moment, right now, you can make a new choice. You can decide right there, even if you're not sure how to get there. You can say, Holy Spirit, or dear God, this person just, if I believed what they just said, it would really hurt my feelings again. But instead of judging it, I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to stand down from my own judgment against them. I choose love. I choose to be treated with love. I choose to know about God's love for me. And I know that if I use what this person just said to me, I could easily decide against them and also against myself. I don't want to do that again. I will decide for them. I'm going to choose to know that they are, as God created them, perfect love, eternal spirit. They are not their personality or what they just said or how they just acted. They are as God created them. Now, I don't know what that looks like yet. But you're teaching me that what I'm looking at is not the truth. And I'm going to take that for face value for today. And I choose to know that this is not the truth of them. And it's also not the truth of me. And now I call upon you, dear God, that you would decide for me about them and about me. I choose love. And I don't know how to get there. But you do. You're the way shower. You're the one who knows, and so I will place myself and them in your perfectly capable hands, and I choose peace and love for both of us, and I receive this blessing in your name. Keep in mind that you don't have to have all those words. It's most important that you get a sense of the message that I'm trying to convey, 
that when someone does something and you're tempted to judge them, pause. You're looking at effects of your past thoughts. You can point over your right shoulder to the back. Your past thoughts, right? You have an opportunity. Seize the moment. The dreamer right here in this present moment, which the ego knows nothing about, it never addresses the present. You can free yourself and them, but you're going to have to give up being right about them being a bad person long enough so that you can make room to be willing to see them as perfect, whole, loving, and complete, eternal spirit, not a body, as God created them. We have to give a little bit of room in our mind for that to take place. And just like we learned about earlier, he says, if you'll give him that little gift, owning that they're just acting out your own thoughts and beliefs, if you will hold that and forgive them for playing that role with you, he's going to trade out the world you see for the one he has for you. It's a great trade, and you're going to love it. Let's go now to sentence six. This was not given you. This was your gift to you and to your brother. Be willing then to have it taken from him and be replaced with truth. And as you look upon the change in him, it will be given you to see it in yourself. As you look upon the change in him, it will be given you to see it in yourself. It will be given you. That's not something you do on your own. If you're willing to see the change in your mind from this terrible person that's acting out on you to a willingness to see them as whole, perfect, innocent, sinless, complete, eternal spirit, just think about the light in them. Imagine a big, beautiful ball of light inside of them. And just focus there. That's enough to let Holy Spirit know that you're focusing on the light in them, not what they said, not what they did, not how they're acting. They're not a body. You're looking at projection. So just focus on their light. And when you do this, you are giving them something. You're focusing on the change in them back to what is real and true in your mind. You're letting that in. And then it will be given you to see the same perfection and innocence in yourself. Paragraph 6. Perhaps you do not see the need for you to give this little offering. Look closer, then, at what it is, and very simply see in it the whole exchange of separation for salvation. All that the ego is is an idea that it is possible that things could happen to the Son of God without his will and thus without the will of his creator, whose will cannot be separate from his own. I'd love for you to underline, if you will, sentence number four, just to the semicolon. This is what the ego is. It's very important. It is an idea that it is possible that things could happen to the Son of God without their will. If you don't have enough money, it means that at some level you are allowing yourself to believe that this can happen to you without your will. It's time to redirect. It's time to choose again. Because as long as not having enough money is happening to you and not from you, it will not change. Because you're placing the cause outside of yourself. It's not about blame. We've talked about this. But it is about cause. The reason you don't have enough money or that you're not well or that you don't have things the way you like them to be, the cause is between your ears. It's happening outside of you, out of projection, just like you have dreams at night. If you try to fix it outside of you, it will not be fixed because the mind that is thinking it up is still thinking it up. So come back to the part of your mind that's thinking it up, and you have help. You can take it straight to the Holy Spirit. But you have to know what you're asking. You can't just say, Holy Spirit, you decide for me, and then go back to dread and worry and fear. 
waking up thinking, oh, I'm going to run out of money and I don't know what I'll do and I better start selling stuff. And those are reactions that the ego will gladly supply. But we can pause. Remember, we're always looking at the effect of our past thoughts, but not our present thoughts. And this is where we can kind of sneak in a little interference in our mind because we can hold the present moment and we can say, wait a minute, stop this circus, right? <laughs> this merry-go-round that I'm on, stop, stop, stop. In this present moment, you can say it out loud, dear God, in this present moment, I choose what you choose for me. Whatever I'm choosing or thinking or believing to create lack or suffering or sickness or despair or loneliness, I have no use for that. I want what you will for me. Those conditions are impossible conditions because you did not create them. I want only what you will for me. I have no interest in what my ego has concocted for me, right? It says that the ego, remember, it is an idea that it is possible that things could happen to you without your will. Everything that's happening right now in this world, all 6.87 billion people, wherever we are, every single one of them is playing a role with you as the dreamer. They're also playing a role with me and with Terry. We can only look through our own eyes. But each one of us can take responsibility for this dream, and we can ask for help from that higher place of consciousness and the healing of our mind that is producing it. But we must abandon our judgment against the people out there that are troubling us because we're going to place the cause outside of ourselves. And this is how the ego protects it and keeps it from being healed. Sentence 5. This is the Son of God's replacement for his will, a mad revolt against what must forever be. This is the statement that he has the power to make God powerless, and so take it for himself and leave himself without what God has willed for him. This is the mad idea you have enshrined upon your altars, and which you worship. And anything that threatens this seems to attack your faith, for here is it invested. Think not that you are faithless, for your belief and trust in this is strong indeed. Now in our mind, there's a battle taking place. I call it the war against ourselves, but we have this battle because we've made up a part of our mind to have this idea that we can split off from God, that we can be this body, this separated body, this personality, that we can be different from every other person on the planet. Everything we see with our eyes in this dream is based on separation. I'm sitting here next to a lamp. It's separated. My computer is separated. My jacket is separated. And so everything is based on separated. There's almost not one thing we see with our eyes that's not separated. And so we've made up a world that's held together by the ego. And remember, one definition for the ego is that something could happen to you without your will. That's how the ego keeps living and breathing in this life experience. It's because when we have a problem or a conflict, we keep trying to solve it in the dream outside of us. It's almost like you're watching a movie in the theater and every time the actors do something you don't like, it'd be like if you go up there and you start pounding on the screen. Well, it doesn't work, does it? They're not going to change. That's not how it's done. You might get yelled at even more, right? <laughs> even by everybody in the theater, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> so let's say you go back to your seat and you think, wow, I'm looking at this movie I do not like, and it just keeps playing. Pause. You're looking at the effect of your past thought. You have an opportunity. Seize that moment right here in the present moment, which the ego knows nothing about and will not bother you there because it doesn't know anything about the present. It is based on holding you in the past or in fear of the future. That's all it knows because it's made up. And so it's based on things that aren't happening right now. If you'll seize the moment of now, you can choose again. You don't have to have a perfect mind or write the perfect movie. 
You can just look up at your own life movie playing on the screen, and you can say, dear God, I don't like this movie, and if this is not your will for me, I have no use for it. But it is key. It is critical. It is essential that you withdraw every scrap of judgment from those characters up there on the screen. If you don't, what you're really saying is they are making me upset. They are doing this to me. The minute you say that, you're in illusion land again. And when you are facing illusion, the truth cannot help you. You bring illusion to the truth. You can't bring truth to an illusion because it's not the truth. And so illusions don't exist by their very nature. We can project them because we're the holy children of God. And even if we hold an idea that's not real or true, we can still project it as if it is true. We're pretty powerful as a dreamer of the dream. Imagine that we can dream up a world of 6.8 billion or whatever the number is. Every person is different. Every person has a different life. Every person has different clothes, personalities, interests, hobbies. And if we're the dreamer dreaming this up, imagine what we can do when we're awake. Let's go now to paragraph 7. The Holy Spirit can give you faith and holiness and vision to see it easily enough. But you have not left open and unoccupied the altar where the gifts belong. Where they should be, you have set up your idols to something else. This other will, which seems to tell you what must happen, you give reality. And what would show you otherwise must therefore seem unreal. So we have these places in our mind where we are either committed to what is real and true or we are committed to what is unreal and untrue. And so he's telling us that we set up idols in our mind. These are places in our mind where we are worshiping the idea that sickness is real, that loneliness is possible, that we can be broke or broken or addicted or unloved or disrespected. The ego has a thousand faces, right? So as we give our time, our attention, our thoughts, our focus to those thoughts, we will continue to look at a very dysfunctional world because this world is coming from dysfunctional thought. But it can be impacted dramatically and swiftly if we'll pause. And if you'll withdraw all those judgments, it's almost like we have 20 fishing poles out there where we've slung the line and we've cast our judgments. I'm going to need you to run around and reel all those lines back in, all of them. All of them. And then we turn inward and we say, God, I have no interest in the world that looks like this. If this is not your will, it's not my will. And I am going to refuse to judge even one person out there because they're just reflecting my belief that we can be in a situation like this. I forgive myself as well. If I did make that decision, which I don't remember, but you say that I did, if I did, I forgive myself. And I ask that you would heal my mind. And I tell God, you have all the room you want. Rearrange all the furniture in my mind, however you would have it be. I choose what you will for me and for everyone. Don't forget to include everyone. You see, if you want happiness for you, but you want that other person over there to pay the price or to be somewhat hurt by something, then we're still focused on illusion. So we always want to choose peace for everyone. Sentence six. All that is asked of you is to make room for truth. You are not asked to make or do what lies beyond your understanding. All you are asked to do is let it in, only to stop your interference with what will happen of itself simply to recognize again the presence of what you thought you gave away. These steps can be used in any situation where you find that your peace is disturbed. Let's just say that I just heard about a loved one that is now in the hospital and it happened suddenly and I'm really 
concerned about that and maybe they're in a lot of pain and it's a very big challenging situation. So I can drive to the hospital and I can be worried all the way and I could be really thinking the worst and I could um, try to give myself a pep talk and try not to do that. But I think there are ways that we can really help them and ourselves. So let's say you're driving along. You have time, right? You've got to get to the hospital safely. So you can use that time. This is the pause. You're right in between your past thoughts and what you're looking at. Remember the ego? You're kind of in this protected zone where your ego can't really mess with you if you will seize that moment. So you could be driving along, and the first thing I like to do is just forgive whoever I am judging and really make that quick and get it done thoroughly. Let's say your loved one was hit from behind by a drunk driver. Straight away, you're going to have to forgive the drunk driver. You're going to have to forgive the other cars. You're going to have to forgive maybe you felt like the police didn't respond fast enough or the ambulance didn't come quickly enough. Whoever you're judging, just search your mind really fast and say, I forgive every single one of you because I realize that you're playing a role with me to mirror maybe my belief that we're not very safe and that people have to deal with shortages and not being safe or protected. So I'm going to forgive every single person I'm judging. And, of course, in Miracles, in the Song of Prayer, it says, first forgive and then pray, and you are healed. So try to forgive first, if you can think of it. You're driving along. Now we're ready to pray. And we can say, dear God, I'm driving along here going to see my loved one, and I'm really worried about them, but I'm going to give this situation to you. And I ask you to decide about all of it. My goal is peace. I want the highest, happiest, most remarkable outcome, and I am willing to know it's possible. With God, all things are possible. So when we ask for something with our thought, but in the backside of our mind, we're saying, well, I don't really think that's possible because this is really a bad situation. You will place the situation outside of God's capacity to help. Because if you decide it can't be healed or solved or corrected, you get to be right until you change your mind because God will never override you. So when you are asking for help, be willing to never decide against yourself or the other person or those you feel that are guilty. Forgive, forgive some more. Set your goal of peace. Ask God for help and ask Holy Spirit to decide for you on how that peace will be accomplished. And it will be the biggest thing for you to remember in that very scary moment, and forgive yourself for that, but remember that your part is to not decide against yourself, don't decide against your loved one, and don't decide against those people that you are holding responsible. Forgive everyone on that stage, clear that stage, and you make a great big for the Holy Spirit to fulfill his function, and he will. He says, happy dreams come true, not because they're dreams, but because they're happy. God is all about happy. When you give anything to him, he's always going to choose happy for you. And you might think, well, I do give things to God, and it's not happy, and it doesn't turn out well. You might also ask yourself, who are you still judging? Who are you still holding out with grievances? Because grievances block miracles. If you're judging yourself for not having enough money, or you're judging yourself because you're sick, or you're judging another person because they got you sick, you know, and on and on. Reel in those fishing lines, right? Every one. You got to take a moment. Reel every one of those fishing lines of judgment that you might have cast already. Forgive yourself. Forgive them. Bring those poles in. Lay them down in the boat and say, I'm along for the ride now. You tell me where this boat goes, and I will not judge. I'm just going to make room in my mind, a big altar in my mind, to make room for what is real and true. Paragraph 8. Be willing, for an instant, to leave your altars free of what you placed upon them, and what is really there you cannot fail to see. The holy instant is not an instant of creation, 
but of recognition. For recognition comes of vision and suspended judgment. Then only it is possible to look within and see what must be there, plainly in sight and wholly independent of inference and judgment. Undoing is not your task, but it is up to you to welcome it or not. Faith and desire go hand in hand, for everyone believes in what he wants. I feel very grateful that I came from women in my family that have such great faith and spiritual understanding. And my grandmother, I'll tell you, every one of you would just love her to pieces. She's such a spiritual woman and never a harsh word about anyone and always very intuitive, saw things before they would happen, would always tip us off. She would even call people in the middle of the night and tell them, you know, your baby's just about to arrive. You might want to go to the hospital. She would be right. And they, literally, she would know before they did. I think it's because she was just always listening and she wasn't judging. And so you get a lot of information that way. And there was a time when one of her sons was really young. I think he was like six, maybe. And it was a time when polio was going around. So she was at work. She was a waitress in a restaurant and worked up to 18 hours a day every day. She had six kids taking care of them mostly by herself. And so she gets called at work and she gets told that her little son was in the hospital and that he had polio and that his legs were paralyzed and that the ambulance had come and picked him up. She gets to the hospital, and I didn't see this just before my time, but I heard the story, and it, it sounds just like her. So she walks in the door, and her little six-year-old waves over. Hi, Mom. And she goes, his name's Eddie. You know, now he's passed on as well. But she's like, Eddie, you get up out of that bed. You don't have polio. You're God's holy, perfect child. Just get up out of that bed. And he just hops up. So he goes from being paralyzed with polio, literally paralyzed. They had already had him in the hospital diagnosed, and he just hops up. But you see what happened there is he just borrowed her understanding. I don't think it's much different than what happened for Jesus and those that he healed, that they borrowed his understanding, his clarity. So you can be that person that has great clarity because you can call on the one that is always clear. And then you'll have that great clarity. You can just bypass your own need to decipher, analyze, figure it out. You can just decide that that little one can't have polio because they're God's perfect child. How could they be sick? Sickness is impossible with God. And you see, when our mind rejects the sickness in favor of the truth, then we, we get ourselves a miracle. Remember that a miracle is the effect of the understanding that what you are looking at is not real. It's an effect of that understanding. It's not God favoring you or placing good things upon you because you did really good today. It's an effect. And if we choose the truth, the truth has its effect because the illusion has been withdrawn. Our investment has been withdrawn. Well, if the dreamer withdraws their investment in the illusion, you can only imagine that that illusion is pretty short-lived because there's nobody manning the farm, right? He left the building. So we're just going to know that we can pause in the present moment. We can make another choice. It's not easy. It's easier to be right about the illusion. That'll be your first temptation. Ego jumps in quick. But we can pause. Take that moment. Remember that God would never choose this for you. There's a line in the Course that I love, and it says, God wills I be saved from this. And I want you to get tough with that. That if you don't like the situation you're in, you say out loud to yourself, God wills I be saved from this. Nonsense, right? This is nonsense. And if I'm the one thinking it up, I withdraw those thoughts. I have no use for them. Holy Spirit, you decide for me. And I refuse to judge. Remember, get those fishing poles. All the lines come in. No judgment. And then the Holy Spirit is free to serve his function. Paragraph 9. We have already said that wishful thinking is how the ego deals with what it wants to make it so. There is no better demonstration of the power of wanting 
and therefore of faith, to make its goals seem real and possible. The ego is pretty clever. So it really hangs us up by getting us to wish or want or hope for. Maybe you have a family member you would love to have a better relationship with, and you've been wanting that for 25 years, right? Whatever that is, it's the wanting, the wishing, the hoping, the fretting, right? So the ego keeps us in that zone of limbo where nothing happens. So think about this. What you want, you focus on. And if you are focusing on a relationship and seeing it as broken or unhealed, it means that's what you want because you're giving your time, your attention, your investment, you're thinking about this broken relationship all through the day, and you're wishing, wanting, hoping for it to get better. But what you're really declaring underneath is that it is imperfect, it is a mess, and it does need healing. So your wanting is focused on what is not there. It's focused on a gap. What you're wanting now is focused on is trying to fill a gap, and there is no gap with God. So if there is a relationship that you would like to see healed, then spend at least 51% of your day focused on seeing it healed. Just being in a joyful state of prayer or meditation, imagine love between you, imagine understanding, compassion, smile, sparkling eyes, Friendship, love, spend 51% of your time there, and then the Holy Spirit will take it from there, and then you will get to see those miracles. But when we are focused, more than 51% of our mind is focused on the gap that we believe is there, that we want filled, we're focused on illusion, and it's not going to change anytime soon. Sentence three. Faith in the unreal leads to adjustments of reality to make it fit the goal of madness. The goal of sin induces the perception of a fearful world to justify its purpose. What you desire, you will see. And if its reality is false, you will uphold it by not realizing all the adjustments you have introduced to make it so. Just looking again at what we see in the world, we just don't realize that it's actually coming from us. I mean, that's a mind-blowing idea. But when you start to allow that to have some room in your mind, it is that giant step of taking your power back. Because if you are looking at the world you see, the one that you believe to be true, now you can ask for the healing of your mind and you will see the world differently. He says we're not here to heal the world. We are here to let our thoughts be healed about the world and then the world is healed and we will see it. Let's go to paragraph 10. When vision is denied confusion of cause and effect becomes inevitable. Now, vision, when we think of it, vision is how we would see with God, how we would see through the eyes of love and truth. So when that vision is denied in favor of seeing someone as dark, evil, dishonest, cocky, arrogant, There's a thousand words for this. When we see someone as less than perfect, that's really an easy rule of thumb. If we see them as less than perfect, vision will be denied until you change your mind. Now, it doesn't mean you sit there and just will them to be perfect. He says, don't try to see your brother's body as perfect. Instead, ask if you could see them as sinless. So let's say there's someone you're judging. Maybe it's a world leader. Maybe it's someone else. But instead of trying to see them perfect, because that may be hard to do with the situation as you see it, but would you be willing to ask God, 
for the vision to see them as sinless. You see, the ego doesn't like it. You can probably feel yourself recoil, even as I suggested. Keep in mind that your ego is not your friend. It has no love for you. It doesn't know anything about love. And it wants you in the conflict and the chaos and the pain. It wants you in judgment because you will automatically forget who you really are and who everyone else is. So in that moment of judgment, when we are so tempted to hold on to that judgment, it's not easy, but it is doable. We can say to ourselves, I am responsible for the world I see. So this person that I'm very tempted to judge, they're playing a role with me, and it's very likely that they are mirroring my belief that people are dark or evil or self-serving or that other people are frail or vulnerable and they are under the feet of those that are more powerful or manipulating. And you start to see maybe I do have a few of those beliefs, right? So now we've recognized that we need some help. And that's we go to the Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit, will you decide for me about this person I'm judging, about this war, this chaos, this conflict? This is not your will and therefore it is not mine. And I'm going to withdraw all my judgment against everyone, including myself, and I ask for the vision to see all of us as sinless. And I genuinely invite you to heal my mind so that I can see. I am determined to see. Sentence two. The purpose now becomes to keep obscure the cause of the effect, and make effect appear to be a cause. That is the purpose of the ego, is to keep you thinking the problem is out there. It's in that person, this person, this situation, that company, that group of people, that gang over there. If you see the problem as out there, and you try to solve it out there, it cannot be solved. Your ego knows this. And it's very clever. It's very slippery. And so it wants you focus where the problem cannot be solved. So it will never be solved. That's ego self-preservation 101. It's almost like the laser pin. Our dog actually loves butterfly shadows. It's so funny. Like butterflies will fly above her head. And she will go searching, searching for the shadow on the ground, never knowing the butterfly is like six inches above her head, right? But she thinks that she's chasing these shadows. Will she ever catch one? No. (laughs) Does she know that? No, even though we did tell her a few times. Look up. (laughs) Sometimes she would, but it didn't click, right? But so she's chasing an effect over, 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 and she'll never catch that shadow, right? Or the laser pen where you run it on the wall and a cat will go looking for the bean. If they caught on that you're the one driving that little laser pen on the wall, well, the cat would just come over and just probably swat it out of your hand like, knock it off. What do you think you're doing to me? Right? So the ego shines the laser pen for us. And we chase it. And we've been chasing it. And nothing is changing. We are the laser pen. We're projecting the picture that we see. And so he's telling us right there that the cause and the effect, the ego tries to make the cause of the problem look like it's out there in those other people, right? But the cause is between our ears. The effect is out there. And as soon as we start to get that sorted out, your life is going to start healing rapidly because the Holy Spirit is going to have enough floor time in your mind to allow it to happen. Sentence three. This seeming independence of effect enables it to be regarded as standing by itself and capable of serving as a cause of the events and feelings its maker thinks it causes. Earlier, we spoke of your desire to create your own creator and be father and not son to him. This is the same desire. The son is the effect, whose cause he would deny. And so he seems to be the cause, 
producing real effects. Nothing can have effects without a cause, and to confuse the two is merely to fail to understand them both. One thing he is bringing up here is that God is the cause, capital C, that's God. We are the effect of the cause, capital E. We are the son of God, the child of God. So God in spirit created us in spirit. We are like the ray of sun to the sun. We are the effect of the light. We are not the cause of the light, which I love because whenever I need help, I have a place to go. I can go back to the cause, back to the source of all in all to help me get things straight. So let's remember God is the cause. We are the effect of the cause. What we create together is our co-creation. So that same principle is, I think we're trying to replicate it at some level, but here we are taking on a thought or a belief that something is true that's not true, but we are the holy child of God, which is a very big deal. And so the holy child of God has now accepted something that's not true, but now we have the capacity to project it as if it is true. Now, in truth, it's a dream, and we will wake up, and it will not be there when we wake up, just like when you wake up from your nighttime dream. But while we're in the dream, we don't realize it's a projection. It's not the truth. But this is where it gets really interesting and fun, because when you're in your own dream, and you know that you're dreaming, or you at least are willing to recognize it, I am the dreamer of my dream. I am looking at the story I made up in the place of the truth. We start to recognize that this is true. And now the Holy Spirit says, great. Now I can enter your mind. I can help you clean up those thoughts and beliefs that are causing all the worry and the fear and the anxiety and the exhaustion. And this is where we can really be helped because we're leaving the door open to the truth because we have shut the door to the illusion. And the way we shut the door to the illusion, first and foremost, withdraw those judgments. The minute you judge an illusion, your back door to the illusion is open. That's not such a big deal. I mean, it's very uncomfortable because you'll have to experience the illusion that you believe is real. But worse than that, when your door to your illusion is open, it's going to feel like the door to the truth is closed. It's one or the other, one or the other. So while you're entertaining the idea that you don't have enough money or that you're not well enough or that you're not loved enough, your door to your illusion is open, right? Which means you're not going to feel the door of truth open in your life, which means that's where the love comes from, the providence, the prosperity, the abundance, the blessing, the companionship, everything good comes from that door. And it's already yours. It's already your house, but it will be unknown to you when your back door is open. Paragraph 11. It is as needful that you recognize you made the world you see as that you recognize that you did not create yourself. They're the same mistake. So he's telling us that we have to recognize that we're looking at a world we see and we made it up. And just try to breathe that in. The more that you understand that, very good things are going to start to happen in your life because you're going to start reclaiming your power and your wisdom and your creative capacity. But he says it's the same mistake to think that you created yourself. You know, we almost believe that we created ourselves. Like, I think I'll be a college graduate, or I think I'll be a professor, or I'll be a a win this pageant. We almost believe that we are inventing who we are in every moment. Well, ego loves this because it loves autonomy. It loves to be independent. It loves to be special and separate. Everything about it, it loves. So if you believe you created yourself, again, your door to your illusion is open, which means the door to the truth will feel like it's closed. It's never closed. But it's like covering your eyes and believing the light went out. 
it didn't go out, but it will be unknown to you while that barrier is seemingly in place. So when you believe that you are inventing yourself or it's up to you to heal yourself, that's the same mistake as thinking that the cause is out there instead of in here. So God is the cause. We are the effect of the cause. You cannot not be perfect. God created you as perfect, free of all limits, unlimited spirit. You are an eternal being, one with God. His will is that you are happy and blessed and that you know his love in every aspect of your life. That's the truth of you. You're not aware of that, perhaps, just like I wasn't, perhaps, because I had this whole other made-up story about myself as being a separated body that could be sick or vulnerable or broke or broken or lonely or sad or I could fail or disappoint. As we hold those thoughts and beliefs, we look out with our eyes and it's looking right back at us, right? So we want to pause right here in the present moment. It's that circle of safety that we're in. Ego can't touch us there. But most of the time, we don't seize that moment. We just get preoccupied with the past or with the future because we get worried about that and we forget all about the present. If you'll seize the present moment and choose again, he says you don't have to see it, but you must choose it. Say you're looking at someone do something very upsetting, very troubling in your mind. Then close your eyes for a moment, just in prayer, and say, God, I'm looking at this person. I'm very tempted to judge them, but I choose to see them sinless. And I don't know how, but you're telling me that they are in truth and that I'm not looking at the truth of them. I am determined to see what you see, to love what you love, to know them as you know them. And I don't know how to do that, but I want to. This is where... Our prayers really take on some uh, extra wattage (laughs) because we're asking to see with God. We're not just asking God to fix something. We're asking to see with true vision. And that is the Holy Spirit's function is to bring it to you. Sentence three. Nothing created not by your creator has any influence over you. And if you think what you have made can tell you what you see and feel and place your faith in its ability to do so, you are denying your creator and believing that you made yourself. For if you think the world you made has power to make you what it wills, you are confusing son and father, effect and source. He says in sentence three, nothing created not by your creator has any influence over you. Think how powerful that statement is in terms of sickness, illness, contagion. How many times do we remind ourselves of that instead of the symptoms and do we have it and did we catch it and what do we need to do to treat it, which all those are fine. It's just that while we focus on the illness itself without taking time for prayer, we can get very caught up in our own projection. So I'm not suggesting that you don't get treated or you don't get medication because we have to take steps that our mind can accept as a practical solution. But don't forget your prayer time. You know, when you make room for your higher consciousness, your God intelligence to decide for you about something, it will be done. It may not feel like it's being done if you're still judging your situation or you're still believing that the illusion has the power and not God. It comes with practice. Don't be discouraged. And above all, don't believe that it's up to you to do the healing or have the perfect mind or the perfect prayer. It's about just question what you see long enough in prayer to invite the Holy Spirit to see for you. But if you do ask for that help while you are still fixated on your judgment against yourself or someone else as it pertains to the situation, then the Holy Spirit will have to wait until you change your mind. Paragraph 12. 
The son's creations are like his father's, yet in creating them, the son does not delude himself that he is independent of his source. His union with it is the source of his creating. Apart from this, he has no power to create, and what he makes is meaningless. It changes nothing in creation, depends entirely upon the madness of its maker, and cannot serve to justify the madness. Your brother thinks he made the world with you. Thus, he denies creation. With you, he thinks the world he made, made him. Thus, he denies he made it. We have all these figures in our dream, we all do, that believe that they are individual bodies, separated, different personalities, they essentially believe they made themselves into whatever they are or whatever they have. And sometimes as course students, we think, well, I can't really have my healing because my partner isn't really into this. They don't really accept it. Or my son or my daughter that's sick, I'm praying for them or about them, but they believe that they're sick. And so their belief kind of overrides or triumphs over mine. But let's back up a little bit and let's remember that in a dream, if you think about dreaming at night and all the figures that might be out there in your dream, who put them there? We did. Who decided what they will think, what they will do, what they will say, how they will act? We did. So there's not as much autonomy going on as we might think. We're all playing roles for each other. So I want you to know that your prayer has value and great, great power. You don't have to wait on anyone. He says that whoever is saner at the time can do this because we are the dreamer of our dream. And most importantly, the dreamer must choose again for the dream to be corrected. And again, the Holy Spirit is the one to make that correction but the door has to be open, and the Holy Spirit must be welcomed. Paragraph 13. Yet the truth is you and your brother were both created by a loving Father, who created you together and as one. That's good to know, isn't it? That the truth is that we and all of our brothers, sisters, whatever word you'd like to use there, we are one with everyone, and we were created by a loving God. Think of that. You might have been raised to think of God in another way, and I will tell you that I have never in my life felt God's wrath in my life. I was raised to know a loving God, and even more so through A Course in Miracles, I have never felt closer, more insulated, more loved, more responded to, more heard. I can't even go through the day without feeling like I'm in a constant conversation with God, my steady companion. And it might sound like too much for some, but it's so natural. It's like talking to the highest part of your mind that can see clearly and knows what's going on and gives you great input and helps you through the day and something's not working out quite right. And even before this call, I was trying to find the right phone to use for the call so it wouldn't sound too different from the others. And I didn't have the right equipment in place, and I had to pause. And I said, Holy Spirit, because, of course, Miracle says the Holy Spirit is the problem solver, the component of God that is there to solve this for you. So I go to Holy Spirit, and I say, I need your help because I just need the right equipment to be able to do what I need to do today. And as I was just sitting at the table and looking at a few things, the thought just came to me exactly what I could do, and it worked so well. But I could tell it didn't come from me. It was a drop-in. You know, you know when you're thinking your own thought and you kind of come up with it yourself, and then you all of a sudden get a thought in the middle of doing something else, and it's a drop-in, and it's the right direction, and you will be heard as well. If you're not feeling heard now, I want you to know that it might just be because there's a lot of noise going on in the world, which means there's a lot of static in our mind as well, and still in mind too. 
and that as we make time to listen, as we try to get 51% of our mind thinking throughout the day with God and not against him, not against the God in others, because God is in everyone we see. And whenever we judge them, we're basically saying, you are not the holy child of God that God created you to be, which means now we must include ourselves with them because separation isn't real. So if I decide that person over there is a loser, (laughs) then I must include myself. If I decide that person over there is not very smart, I must include myself with them. If I decide that person over there is broke or broken, well, then I must be the same thing as well. So be careful about those beliefs. Just be willing to stand down on your need to make an assessment. Pause and just ask Holy Spirit to decide for you, almost like through the eyes of a little child. Imagine that, what if I didn't know this person or their past or their history? What if I could just pause? And say, Holy Spirit, I know this person, I'm very tempted to judge them right now, but I am going to refrain. I'm going to let you handle this. You get the door. Let's go now to sentence two. See what proves otherwise, and you deny your whole reality. But grant that everything that seems to stand between you and your brother, keeping you from each other, and separate from your father, you made in secret, and the instant of release has come to you. Maybe you can underline those words. The instant of release has come to you. I mean, even here, as you're studying with us, you must want to see things differently. That's what brought us to the Course, and it truly has healed our minds in ways we could have never imagined And our life is different now than it was before. And we are both so very grateful. So this is your instant of release. It has come to you. Call on that higher place in your mind to do more of the deciding for you. And remember that if you made a mistake in the past, the Holy Spirit is going to undo all the consequences of your wrong decision if you will let him. Sentence four to the end. All its effects are gone because its source has been uncovered. It is its seeming independence of its source that keeps you prisoner. This is the same mistake as thinking you are independent of the source by which you were created and have never left. Let's say that you're having a dream at night and you're all caught up in the dream and it's really scary and dark and people are doing awful things and It's just the worst, and you're in this dream, and you're trying to fix it, and you're trying to come up with solutions, and you're trying to protect yourself, and you're trying to make enough money so you can feed your family and survive, and it's just stressful on every single level. And then let's say all of a sudden you realize, I think I must be asleep and dreaming. Do you mean really, like, I'm dreaming this? I'm making this up? (gasps) I mean, what do I do now? Well, we can go to God and we can say, hey, I think I get it, that I'm dreaming this awful dream. And I want to wake up. I don't want this awful dream. Now, some people don't want to wake up because they think they will lose. They think they will lose their family, their friends, their prestige, all that they worked for, their education, their beautiful car, their little kitten, people think they will lose. And what I like to remember, that's straight from the Course, is that with God there is no loss. Everything that you love is yours. Everything that you enjoy, that is part of you. Only love is real. It's all the parts that don't work, don't feel good, are upsetting. Those are the things that shall fall away. So keep in mind that waking up is a wonderful thing. You will not lose anything you love and that the Holy Spirit will guide it all the way through and that you don't need to be afraid of waking up because as you wake up, you're waking back to what you knew before. And he says it'll be like an old song 
that you first remember a little bit and then you remember a lot. And it's something you know very, very well. So be sure to remind yourself and let God know that you're really excited about waking up and you want to wake up and bring it on. Wake me up. I want to get back to the happiness that is your will for me. And while we're still in the dream and we're still asleep in the dream, if we are under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you will be happy. It's called the happy dream. Because when we are under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will never decide against us. And so the happy dream will be consistent. And that's where we're all headed right now. It's all good, as my brother says all the time. It's all good. I just love that. And so it's all good. But be sure to not bring those old, unhealed beliefs with you. Don't bring those judgments with you. Lay them down. And, of course, it says lay down your arms and come wholly empty into your God. Let him fill you again. Let him remind you how much you're loved, how safe you are, how much happiness he has for you. If you're not sure or you haven't seen it, be determined to see it. But you must divest of the story that you have made, the one I have made. We have to disengage from our story, close that door to the illusion, just like we've been talking about tonight. It doesn't mean block people or lock people outside of your house. This is what we do in prayer. And this opens the door to the Holy Spirit. In truth, it's always open, but it won't feel open until that old back door is closed. Harry, why don't you close us out here tonight with one of your Q&As? I will, but I first must say, Robin, that as the Course says, my only goal is peace, but I think I've just added a second sub-goal that only you and a few others can fully appreciate. I am going to cause the cost of my brain to be marked down. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, like, if we didn't have it at all, we'd probably be better off, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> it's that brain. It gets in the way every time. <laughs> That's okay. Our brain can be used for good, too, right? So under the Holy Spirit's right. guidance, right. everything that we experience can be used to bless everyone. Price is already going down, down, down. <laughs> <laughs> the price is already going down. That's great. <laughs> so, question. What is it that God would have us remember in our daily lives? And the answer comes in the workbook, Lesson 124, Paragraph 1, Sentence 1. Today, we will again give thanks for our identity in God. Our home is safe, protection guaranteed, and all we do power and strength available to us in all our relationships. We can fail in nothing. Everything we touch takes on a shining light that blesses and that heals. At one with God and with the universe, we go our way rejoicing with the thought that God himself goes everywhere with us. That is so beautiful. And if you were to read that to someone a family person or a friend that doesn't study any of this, they might think you're just out of your mind. You know, that your home is safe, your protection is guaranteed in everything you do, power and strength is available to you in all of your relationships. So if you're one of the people that feels like you have not seen this, you have not seen the upside of what he's talking about, be determined to see it. Ask him to see it. And I know it sounds like a crazy request because in our world, none of that seems true. But that's what he's trying to offer us is that there is another way to see what we're seeing. But we have to be willing to question what we are seeing in the present moment, not judge it, lay down the judgment, forgive, and ask God to decide for us through the Holy Spirit. And then he can show you a world that you have been wanting and it will replace the one that you are happy to let go of. So you have a guide. He's on duty 24-7. And if you don't see a safe, protected home and power and strength in all of your relationships, pause. 
and say, God, I want to know more about that. I'm going to give you my 51% of my time, my attention, my interest. At a minimum, I'm going to just imagine that this is true and it's mine and it's already occurred and that what I'm looking at is not the truth. I'm going to question the illusion instead of questioning God. And when that starts to happen, you are on your road to complete healing and the miracles will happen and you like the rest of us will be so amazed every single time it happens because all along the way the Holy Spirit will be correcting things, healing your mind, clearing off your path so there's no obstacles and everything will be guided for your happiness. Dear God, we thank you for this time together, for everyone listening and spending this valuable time with us. We appreciate them. We love each one of them. And we thank you for all of the time that you spend with us healing our mind. That door is open. We're going to try to keep that door to illusions closed the best we can by standing down on our judgments, relinquishing it entirely. One day, we hope to. We're moving towards it. And we just thank you for the highest, happiest, most remarkable outcome in this world, that we will see the world that you would have us see because the will of God has already been accomplished. Amen.